The world is at a pivotal moment. Geopolitical clashes have spawned an intense race for technology leadership. Industries are being reshaped. Globalization is being reimagined. I'm Andrew Schwartz. And I'm Kirti Gupta. We're here to break down how geopolitics and technology are impacting our economy, our security, and, and our, our daily, daily lives. lives. This, this is, is Geotech, Geotech Wars. Wars. Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of the Geotech Wars podcast. I'm so excited to be joined today by our very own Remco Zweslut, who is an adjunct fellow here at CSIS with our International Security Program. Remco is also the co-founder and executive director of the Horizon Institute for Public Service, a nonprofit organization that fosters the next generation of emerging tech policy leaders. Remco is a well-rounded scholar, doing his PhD at Oxford, working at think tanks in Washington, D.C., and regularly publishing in media outlets like Wall Street Journal and Washington Post. And his area of expertise includes the U.S. tech workforce, STEM immigration, research security, and technology competition with China. Welcome, Remco. It's wonderful to be here. I'll jump straight in, Remco. At Geotech Wars, we have been discussing the geopolitical landscape right now, and the importance of the United States to lead in critical technology areas like semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and other foundational technologies. But none of this happens without a skilled workforce. And that's what we're here to unpack with you today, with your research in this area. So let me start with a simple question. To remain globally competitive, The U.S. needs a skilled workforce. Do we have what we call the science, technology, engineering, math workforce that we need? I think it's actually, in fact, a very complicated question. But the short answer, I would say, is probably no. If you zoom out, you know, we're talking here on a geopolitics podcast, and it's always good to put things in a historical sort of macro perspective. There have been a couple of trends in the past few decades that have really shaped, I think, the need for talent today. One is the shift to a knowledge-based economy. So a lot of competitive advantage for countries depends on being strong in sort of knowledge sectors, a lot of intangible technologies, not so much sort of hardware anymore, though that's definitely still very important. And the second, of course, is that the world has globalized a lot. And a lot of the intangible technology can travel across the world much faster, whether intentionally, you know, we have the internet now, you can open source things, it can travel across the globe in seconds. Whereas previously, you know, in the 80s, It would take a lot to move comparative advantage across borders. Now it can happen very quickly if you rely purely on data or intellectual property, whereas before that wasn't the case. And so I think those are really two background factors that have shaped the centrality of talent in technology competition today. You also obviously still need talent for things like manufacturing and the hardware side of the economy. I know on the podcast, you've talked a lot about the importance of know-how in sort of manufacturing technologies and reshoring, for example, in the semiconductor industry, which we'll talk more about, I'm sure. There's also obviously a mix uh, of sort of intangibles and tangibles, you know, how much of cars and planes and those kinds of large physical systems now rely on software. Talent in this sort of economy is really the key defensible advantage that nations still have. If you have the talent that is developing the software, if you have the talent that knows how to do the manufacturing, that is the way that you retain comparative advantage in today's globalized knowledge economy. So I think it's no surprise that, for example, Xi Jinping for China has called talent the first resource in China's technology strategy. Driving towards independence is going to require talent. Driving towards innovation is going to require talent. And China has organized a huge push to boost its STEM talent base for that reason. In the U.S., I think people have also recognized this problem, but the investments and the policy changes haven't really been commensurate to the scale of of the need. The importance of intangibles. Looking at the data that back in the 1960s and 70s, majority of the value of S&P 500 firms, for example, 80% used to be intangible assets, labor and capital, and only 20% in intangible assets, ideas, know-how, skill set, etc. And that has completely flipped by the early 2000s. And most of the value of the firms is now in intangibles, know-how, knowledge, skilled workers. And so that's probably the most important resource. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that talent shortage looks like right now in the U.S.? 
Definitely. And I think this is also a moving target. It's going to change over time. I think the US has done a lot to boost its technological leadership in the last few years, both because it's important to national security, because it's important to the economy, especially in light of competition from China on this stuff. And so we've seen a lot of pushes, I think, in semiconductors, incentive investments have been foremost among these. As these subsidies started being talked about, and especially after the legislation passed, I think people, including you, Kirti, have brought up, this is going to require not just money, but also people. We are building, ideally, multiple new fabrication facilities. We're building all this infrastructure and this technology. These are going to require workers. I think estimates have said logic fab in the semiconductor case is going to require about 3,000 workers and memory fabs, it's about 6,000. So the CHIPS Act, this $50 billion, was going to require probably 30,000 workers. These were estimates that were sort of being talked about. And not just any kind of workers, but we're talking about really skilled, like PhDs in material science and electrical engineering and so on. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And so these are not, you know, 30,000 workers that are currently sitting around hoping for a job. These are very gainfully employed people (laughs) who have many different options. And where the unemployment rate was already very, very low, even before the CHIPS Act incentives were passed, there was already talk about a shortage in the industry. And so this came on top of that. A lot of the reasons for these investments in sort of the context of geopolitical competition is that a lot of the technology is currently overseas. Semiconductors are primarily manufactured in different countries. And so if you want people who have that kind of experience, who who have run these fabs before, who have worked in these fabs before, it's not just a matter of transferring domestic workers. It's also a matter of getting workers from overseas. We've seen since the CHIPS Act has passed, some of these investments have been announced, a lot of delays in, you know, the building of fabs, because that itself requires talent, and also putting the fabs into operational capacity, which is going to require these these workers with with process knowledge and skills. One example, TSMC announced a big plant in Arizona, upping to, I think, a $40 billion investment. That plant has already been delayed by one to two years, with the lack of a skilled workforce playing a huge role in those delays. And this isn't just sort of a thing that happens with these mega projects. They have had similar projects in Japan, and those fabs are actually on schedule. We're seeing this not just sort of in the TSMC case and not just in Arizona. This the kind of thing is happening across the country in the United States. So we're seeing these delays that people have talked about since the passing of the legislation because it's absent major reforms that the U.S. hasn't done. It's really hard <laughs> to, to get these kind of workers. That's you know one case where we're seeing that. The Semiconductor Industry Association has projected that there's probably going to be a shortage of around 70,000 STEM workers in the industry by the end of 2030, just in semiconductor industry. So that's a longer term projection. You have more uncertainty when you're talking about time scales like that, but that's a huge number. The broader economy, they estimated, would lack about 1.4 million STEM workers. I always have question marks when you hear numbers like that. It's such a hard thing to estimate, but it's a huge problem. Um, And it's not just semiconductors. We're seeing, you know, crazy salaries in AI, an indication that there are a lot of people who are needed that aren't currently on the labor market. And so, yeah, there are a lot of sectors that are facing these sorts of challenges. What's the solution? You think that it's just a matter of time as these investments that the U.S. is now making for having a skilled workforce in the future pans out and we have more graduates coming out of these kind of programs to fill the workforce? Or... Ship would have sailed by that. <laughs> <laughs> so education and workforce investments definitely have to be part of this portfolio. There's no substitute for having that investment in your domestic workforce base. At the same time, I think we will also need to make immigration part of the portfolio of solutions to these issues. Education investments and policy can take decades to play out. If you're talking about a semiconductor manufacturing facility that needs someone with PhD level knowledge or years of experience, you can invest in K through 12 today. And that's important. But that investment today would pay off in the 2040s. That person would be ready for this labor market niche in the 2040s. I think being cognizant of the urgency of these challenges and the time scale on which we need to solve them, you can't only solve it through STEM education and workforce investments. You also need shorter term solutions. And that, you know, is going to need to include immigration. Longer term solution, education policy to prepare for a future, but shorter term immigration. What does immigration of skilled workers look like today? And where are we? It's a hard challenge. The U.S. has historically had, I think, a great ability to attract international talent. So maybe to put this into context, we can talk a little bit about how this compares to, for example, China. On purely domestic grounds, you know, the U.S. is not going to compete with China. (laughs) This is a frame in which it you know, it's highlighted how 
education isn't the only you can do if you want to remain competitive in today's society. So um, China has about four times the population the United States does. During the Cold War, when we had a similar competitor in the Soviet Union, you know, the U.S. and the Soviet Union had roughly the same population levels. Today, the U.S. has 300, 350 million people. China has 1.4 billion. And so if you're just looking at domestic investments, you're not going to compete with China on that front. China has a long way to catch up in. And even though they have been facing demographic challenges, their education system is coming from a much lower baseline than the U.S.'s system. China has like really been catching up on these investments. One illustrative statistic when you look at STEM PhDs, in 2000, so 25 years ago, the U.S. had double the number of STEM PhD graduates that China had. There were about 20,000 graduating from U.S. universities every year compared to 10,000 graduating from Chinese universities every year. And the average quality in China was much lower than the average quality in the U.S. By 2025, forecasts suggest that China will have double the STEM PhD grads that the U.S. has. <laughs> so it is completely flipped. China will be graduating nearly 80,000 STEM PhDs compared to about 40,000 in the U.S. Both countries have invested in education policy in the skill set, but China is ac accelerating faster. Right. The U.S. grew from 20,000 to about 40,000. China grew from 10,000 to 80,000. So the U.S. doubled, but China adexed. Um, and at the same time, you know, China has been raising the quality levels a lot. It is still not entirely competitive with the United States, but the trend line is definitely one of convergence. And then you have to also think that in the U.S., like more than half of these STEM PhD graduates are international students. They are not domestic students, whereas in China, it's almost entirely domestic. That is, I think, a background fact that U.S. policymakers have to grapple with and haven't really grappled with. But it also illustrates, I think, a comparative advantage the U.S. has had, which is immigration and attractiveness to international students, right? The fact that half of STEM PhDs in the U.S. are international and that a lot of those people are like the smartest people in the world who all want to come here and almost all want to stay here is a thing that the U.S. can draw on to account and sort of for this population difference that it has with, with China, right? We're not just drawing from the 300-ish million people who are born in the United States. We are drawing from the 7 billion people uh, who live across the world who all want to come here, whereas that's much harder for China. There are some surveys that have been actually quite consistent over the years that have shown, you know, if you globally survey kind of scientists and people who work in technology at sort of a high level, less than 10% report being interested in moving to China at one point in their career, whereas like close to 60% report being interested in moving to the United States. And a lot of these surveys predate some of the recent political crackdowns and, and issues that China has faced. You know, that is a huge asset and that's been very stable over time. Uh, people want to come. The question is, are we going to make it possible for them to come as well? Let me ask you one question about, you know, China, where we are still there. Does China still face a STEM shortage like we do in the United States with this uptick in investment and output of the skilled graduates? It is hard to know. <laughs> I think you as an economist know, you know, these are tough questions in general, sort of labor market dynamics. And then in China, you face additional challenges around data availability and reliability and things like that. It's hard to know. I think there are a lot of reports of shortages in the Chinese economy. And at the same time, you also see a lot of reports of unemployment. There are question marks there of how we interpret that. You know, a lot of these graduates are not quite plugging into labor market needs or might need more applied experience before they can, for example, in the Chinese semiconductor industry, you know, there's still a lot of reports of like, we lack the skilled workers needed to, to scale up our manufacturing. But someone coming out of a STEM degree from a Chinese university might not be a match for the jobs that need to be filled to do that manufacturing because they need on-the-job training and those sorts of things. And, you know, it's part of the weakness of a top-down system the way China has is the government can kind of direct education and you almost can eliminate feedback loops from employers. The Chinese government sets targets for how many STEM graduates there need to be, but it's a little bit detached from like the needs of the labor market sometimes if the government hasn't anticipated uh, the economy correctly, for example. And there might still be a quality issue. What are other countries doing about this? Yeah, other countries, I think, face similar challenges. I feel like these, uh, you know, frictions in the labor market show up kind of everywhere. And talent shortages are talked about almost everywhere. It's funny, you know, every country can think its own problems are unique. <laughs> but then when you read global reports, it's actually like everyone's kind of saying the same thing. Other countries are facing similar shortages and issues. Things that some other countries have done a lot better, including, for example, Canada, 
is they've made very flexible immigration systems that are indexed to labor market needs. And so I think that's where some of these differences are showing up when you're looking sort of beyond the US-China frame into third countries. Everyone is also trying to invest in education, research, and things like that domestically. I think the biggest difference in policy that you see is who's you know good or bad at immigration. There is not only a global war for technology leadership, but coupled with it is a global battle for talent, for the skilled workforce. And everybody's facing such shortages and everybody has their own version of a solution. So coming back to the United States, so long-term education policy, short-term immigration. As I think you just mentioned, but let me highlight this, immigration has been an advantage for the United States. As you said, half of the advanced graduate students, etc., in STEM, in science and technology are foreign-born immigrants. How is that working out for us? Are we able to fill the needs for the economy today with that? Or are we going to in the near future? Uh, What does that data look like? You can see a lot of benefits being derived. I mean, if you look at, you know, the major technology companies that are kind of in the news every day and, and driving a lot of US innovation and progress, if you look at the origins of where the founders of those companies have come from or where their families have come from, the majority are actually foreign born or have families that, you know, weren't living in the US uh, decades ago. You know, that extrapolates also to the broader kind of startup and tech sector when you look at statistics, for example, on unicorn companies, so companies that get $1 billion valuations, and you look at their founders, a lot of those are immigrants. Those are the companies that are creating a lot of the jobs that are also driving the US labor market, which is, I think, one, you know, in this conversation, there's always a background question of, well, can't we just do it with domestic workers or aren't immigrants crowding out? domestic workers. And in fact, they often create jobs and crowd in domestic workers as opposed to pushing them out. And so I think that's one thing that's really important. When you look at national security, I was just reviewing a forthcoming study uh, out of the National Defense Industrial Association, which is trying to map the kind of national defense industrial base, you know, hypersonics, directed energy, technology is really crucial to, to the U.S. military. And looking at the workforce in that industry too, even though it requires you know, security clearances often to work on these technologies, immigrants and foreign-born graduates make up a huge share of those sectors as well. And we could not be innovating in the way that we are if it weren't for foreign-born uh, folks, many of whom came here initially as students. There are more than 100,000 foreign-born graduates in the defense industrial base in the United States. And so you know, it has worked out, I think, for the U.S. very well <laughs> in, in, on many dimensions. I think at the same time, there's not enough room in the system uh, to accommodate the kind of talent that's needed. And that's because we've actually locked in place through legislation numerical caps on the number of immigrants who can come in every year. And those caps were set in the 1990s. And obviously, the economy has grown a bunch. uh, The population has grown a bunch. But these numbers have not shifted at all. What does those numbers look like? So you're saying for 30 years, we have a locked number of skilled immigrants that we grant visas to? Absolutely, yeah. So the numbers for green cards, which I think is the critical bottleneck in the system, and actually before I get into the specific numbers, we can take a step back for for listeners who aren't super familiar with the immigration system. There are, I would say, like four steps you can think of as as folks might journey into the U.S. uh, and become citizens through immigration in, in the context of tech talent, I should say. The first step is many people enter as students, international students at U.S. universities. They, after being students and graduating, can go on to a temporary visa. The most famous one might be the H-1B visa, but there are many others as well in that category. And that allows them to stay for maybe three years, maybe five years, and then they can renew temporary status after that potentially. But it's sort of a time-bound temporary status. After that, uh, you could transition from a temporary visa to permanent residency by getting a green card. And that's the hardest step for people to make often, going from that kind of temporary status, whether it's as a student or on a work visa, to permanent resident. And then the final step, once you are a permanent resident, is getting to citizenship from there. That's a relatively easy step because it's just a matter of time. If you've had a green card for three to five years, you can apply for citizenship and, and convert. And so the caps that are most important are one, caps on temporary visas. Student visas are uncapped so that there's no limit there. But the H-1B is capped, for example, uh, at 85000 per year, I think. And green cards are capped as well. And a lot of people get stuck in this sort of temporary limbo where they have to be like, 
you know, am I going to buy a house? Am I going to bring my family here? Am I going to stay? Am I going to found a company? And, you know, and like, I don't know if I can stay in this country for two years. And so that's really hard position to be in as an individual and also as someone who might make uh, an investment or, you know, innovate in the economy. The reason that transitioning from temporary status to a green card is hard is that the number of green cards per year is capped at 140,000 for employment-based green card. And then on top of that, overarching cap, there are country-based caps. So only a certain percentage of those green cards can go to citizens of any particular country. And the country-based cap does not vary by population size. So the same cap applies to Luxembourg, a country of, you know, very small numbers, uh, as to India, which is a country with like much more than a billion people living there. And so what we're seeing in the system is especially huge backlogs for immigrants coming from high population countries, especially India is like by far the top one, and then China. And those are also the countries that are providing a lot of the world's tech talent. That's a huge, huge issue. And um, I can talk more about what those backlogs look like and, and the consequences of that. But I think that's you know an issue in the, in the system for sure. CSIS, we recently hosted the head of the Migration Policy Institute, and he was giving us these numbers and exactly like you saying that not only were these quotas locked 30 years ago, and they haven't moved with the population growth, demand for skilled workers and so on, but a big percentage of these quotas are also taken by the families of the skilled workers, the 140,000 permanent resident uh, green cards. A lot of those or a big proportion of those are actually taken by the families of one of the skilled workers. So it's actually a smaller number than 140,000 that we're able to retain every year in the skilled workforce. So it'll be it'll be nice to know, go through the numbers a little bit and contrast that with uh, some of the shortages that you just mentioned, like 30,000 semiconductor alone. Yeah, the proportion of uh, green cards that go to family members instead of to sort of people who are primarily sponsored for the employment-based job offers that they're getting is about half. So like half of these 140,000 visas are going to spouses, dependents, like children. In fact, it's, you know, the, the top line number, even though it's actually already quite low, <laughs> is actually misleadingly high in some ways. Um, and so the backlogs are are huge as a consequence of that. I think for India, where their largest the projected wait time right now for an Indian immigrant who has to go through the system, even if they have an employer who's already been willing to sponsor them for a green card, which is an arduous process. So it's a sign that this person is quite important to the U.S. employer who's willing to do that. The projected wait time for them would be around 90 years, nine zero. There are tables that you know do these projections where there's actually a column where you have to account for how many people will die <laughs> while they are waiting for a green card to happen to come to an estimate of how many people are actually going to make it through. If you need that column in your table, your system is broken. Like that, <laughs> that, that column should not exist, right? And so that's, that's a huge, you know, that's just a huge issue. That's a good point. If you have a column, you know, that's already a huge red flag. It's interesting because in this election year, immigration is a huge item. But the oxygen is taken out of the room when it comes to immigration on a different kind of immigration, not the skilled workforce, you know, legal immigration. So let's talk about this one, because this is related, you know, more relevant to geotech wars, technology leadership. What should we be doing? What, what do you propose immigration reform should look like? I will talk specifically about the tech side of it, because that's my, my area of expertise. I think, you know, these caps that we just talked about being kind of the critical bottlenecks. Unfortunately, those are in statute. So laws passed by Congress and only Congress can do things to change that. There have been people who have argued that actually it's not clear based on the law whether family members should count towards the cap or not. So if you had an ambitious legal strategy as the president, you know, maybe you can argue that you should be trying to change that unilaterally. But I think that would definitely be politically very controversial. Ultimately, big changes are going to require congressional action. And in an election year, yeah, that's super hard. I actually think there's a lot of bipartisan support for the points that you know I've been making, that others have been making on these issues. And we've seen a lot of high profile endorsements and recognition of this issue. So the National Security Commission on AI, which you know was a major task force stood up a few years ago called Immigration Reform and National Security Imperative for this reason. 
we've seen senior officials from every prior administration, including the Trump administration, sign letters saying that immigration reform is a national security issue uh, and should be treated as such and should be bipartisan. We've actually seen prominent members of Congress change their mind on this issue publicly, but it hasn't ultimately gotten it kind of unstuck in the process of legislative reform. A lot of that is, I think, a little bit less about people having substantive disagreements about the need for STEM immigration to compete with China and a lot more about process and this getting caught up in kind of these broader political conversations that are more controversial. One of the most telling moments, I think, in the legislative history of this is when this was a conversation around the time of the CHIPS Act, right? We were talking about we're passing these subsidies. Maybe we should also be broadening pathways, especially maybe you can target it for semiconductor talent specifically, right? Just create like a small carve out for semiconductor talent, make sure these subsidies work when it comes to immigration. And there were conversations then about we could include that in the bill. People who are on the judiciary committees in Congress really want to hold on to the jurisdiction <laughs> that they have over immigration. And so they ultimately blocked that from becoming a part of this broader innovation bill. Um, similarly, because it's recognized as a national security issue in the defense budget bill, the NDAA, immigration provisions have been you know, attached to that or at least attempted to be attached to that. And in those cases, too, it's been more of a jurisdictional issues where senators have actually said, and this is, I'm quoting Chuck Grassley now in particular, who's a senior Republican in the Senate on immigration issues, uh, said, I've actually changed my mind. Like he, he said on the record, like 10 years ago, I would have opposed this idea of increasing the number of STEM green cards for technology competition. I would have just been opposed to it. I didn't recognize the need for the workforce or the competition threat that would require us to do this. I actually now do. <laughs> I think it's good. I just don't want to set the precedent that these issues can be tackled through the defense budget bill as opposed to through the Judiciary Committee. And so he opposed it not because he disagreed with the idea, but because of jurisdictional and political dynamics. And so I think that's you know both a sign that these ideas actually have a lot of broad appeal, but also that the politics don't necessarily get any easier because of that. That's very helpful, Ramco. And another addition I wanted to make is that the executive order on artificial intelligence from the Biden administration in that of October last year also had this suggestion about maybe a carve out for AI talent, <laughs> but um, just like you mentioned for semiconductors. But sounds like there is a certain mechanism that needs to be cracked open, but there's hope. This is really, really insightful. Let me just end by asking you a little bit about the Horizon Institute for Public Service that you've co-founded and you direct. Very happy to talk about that. The immigration work and the U.S. workforce work broadly was something I worked on as a think tank researcher, first at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology and then at CSIS. I also recognized the issues the government faces in particular with some of these same workforce questions, right? We're talking about the U.S. economy broadly needing a lot of talent, but also the U.S. government specifically <laughs> needs a lot of talent and has faced its own issues in attracting people who know things about AI and biotech, both to drive forward innovation in which government plays a huge role and to think about how to balance that with some of the challenges and risks that these technologies can pose. And so the mission of the Horizon Institute for Public Service is actually to build pipelines into public service and policy to give the government greater access to talent that has backgrounds in emerging technologies. And, uh, you know, we do that through a variety of programs, including a fellowship program that places folks in government. We run a big career website called emergingtechpolicy.org that helps people break in. We run workshops, things like that. And so, those are all activities under the umbrella of helping the government build its tech workforce. On that hopeful note, Ranko, thank you so much for joining us in conversation today and trying to unpack what we need to do to get the skill, the workforce, to continue to have our political geotech advantage. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning into Geotech Wars. You can listen to more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to great content. Don't forget to rate and review us. Until next time.